O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, you have invited us to come before you to worship and to praise your holy name. Grant that we may worship you in spirit and in truth, so that our worship is pleasing to you. Let your saving grace work in our hearts and cause us to grow in our faith and in our love for you. May you strengthen us for this week to come, that in all things we may live as your dear children and give all glory to your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name we pray, amen. begin our service this morning in the name of our triune God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, imploring him in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. We join to confess our sins. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended thee and justly deserve thy temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray thee of thy boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called servant of the word, announce God's grace unto each of you. And in his stead, and by his command, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our 
scripture reading for this morning, Transfiguration, is the account of the transfiguration as recorded by the evangelist Mark. This event made, marked a turning point in Jesus' ministry. After his transfiguration, the Bible tells us that he begins to turn his face toward Jerusalem, where he would eventually make the payment for the sins of the world. So here in this account, he takes his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and is glorified before them, that they too might know that Jesus is the fulfillment of those prophecies of the Old Testament, God's very own Savior. We read from Mark chapter 9. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Now, as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things that they had seen, till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, saying, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Then he answered and told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. And how is it written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has also come, and they did to him whatever they wished as it is written of him. The Elijah that Jesus was referring to, as well as the Old Testament, was the coming of John the Baptist as the forerunner of the Savior. And at this point in Jesus' ministry, John had been put to death, the reason that Jesus says they have done to him whatever they wished, as a reminder also that the world is against the message of salvation that comes from God and is not of ourselves. We rejoice in this salvation that does not come from ourselves, but comes from God and his Savior, Jesus. Please rise this morning as we join to make confession of our faith. We'll be using this morning the words of the Nicene Creed, which can be found on page 22 in the front of your hymnal. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Invite the children to come forward to sing their hymn of praise, 
This hymn can be found in your bulletins this morning, and I would invite the congregation to join the children in the singing of the last stanza as it's found in your bulletin. Please rise. Every word of God is pure and has been recorded for our instruction in righteousness. That word of God which we are considering this morning is found recorded in the Old Testament book of Genesis chapter 28 verses 10 through 22. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of that place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you. And will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, 
surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. This is the word of our God. Please be seated. In the name of our Savior, in the name of our Redeemer, in the name of the one who was glorified and revealed himself as our God and as our Savior, dear fellow redeemed. I wrestled a little bit this week with the text that we're looking at. In fact, I had a different text chosen. I have a pericope that I use that has three different texts, one from the Old Testament, two from the New Testament, and I had one of those picked out to preach on it about halfway through the week. I was thinking about this scripture reading, and I decided to make this one the text, and the one that I had actually chosen as the sermon text to begin with, I dropped out of the service completely. But this is an interesting text. It's a familiar account, and yet I think that's one of the reasons why I passed over it so quickly early on in the week. It's something that we've heard about. We've heard about Jacob's stairway to heaven, the ladder, the dream that he had. And yet there's so much in this that we as Christians can benefit from and learn from. It's helpful to begin with to recognize where Jacob is in his life as he has this dream. You might remember who Jacob is. Jacob was one of two sons of Isaac, the son of Abraham. So he's one of Abraham's grandchildren. Jacob was known as later on in life, as well as earlier in life, as the deceiver. You might remember one of the stories that's so familiar about Jacob when he was young, we were told that he would be the one who would receive the promise of his father Isaac. He would inherit the promise that led to the Savior. But he was the younger. His older brother Isaac was born first, even though they were twins. And his father loved Isaac, of Esau, thank you, Esau rather than Jacob. Well, this caused a lot of problems within the family. As his father Isaac was getting old, he sent his son Esau out. He said, kill a deer, bring it back to me, and I will give you my blessing. Now, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, Jacob's mother, loved Jacob more than Esau, and so she stuck her nose in and said, no, we're not going to let this happen. Jacob, go out and kill a lamb, and I'll make it like your dad likes, so he won't know the difference. He can't see. He's blind anyway. And we'll trick him into giving you the blessing instead of your older brother. So Jacob does it. He goes out and kills a lamb, brings it to his mom. His mom dresses it up, makes it taste like venison somehow. Gives it to her father, and Jacob comes in. He's got some of the wool from the sheep on his arms because he's not hairy like his brother is. And he tricks his father into giving him the blessing. Now you can imagine how frustrated, not just frustrated, but angered his older brother was when he returned home and found out that Isaac had given his younger brother Jacob the blessing that Esau should have had. In fact, the Bible tells us that Esau was so mad that he wanted to kill his brother Jacob. The word Jacob literally means supplanter or deceiving one. And he fulfilled his namesake. He deceived his brother, he deceived his father, 
because he did not trust that his God would fulfill the promise that he had made to him. Because of the friction between Esau and Jacob, both Isaac and his wife Rebekah said, you need to leave. You need to get out of here. Go up to where our family is in Haran. Find a wife up there, a good godly wife. And when things are safe back here, we'll call for you. And so here's Jacob. In your bulletin, I have a map along the sermon outline. He started off in the south in Beersheba. That's where his home was. He had to make about a 600-mile trek on foot up to Haran, where Rebekah's family was from. Now, at this point, he was at that first bullet point in Luz, or Bethel, about 70 miles into his journey. Jacob didn't have a thing to his name. He had some clothes and some food in his backpack, but he had nothing to call his own. He was basically homeless, familyless at this point, and he had a lot of questions about what his future held for him. Quite interesting for a guy who's just stolen the birthright from his brother and thinks that he's going to get everything, right? And so here's Jacob. On his way, leaving his home, leaving his family, not knowing what the Lord has in store for him. Questioning, possibly, what he has done in the past and the way in which he has done it, deceiving his father and his brother. And so here's where the Lord then appears to Jacob at Luz with a dream. A dream of a stairway. The top reached into heaven. The bottom came down to the earth. Angels were ascending and descending upon it. God here reveals to Jacob, and he also reveals to us, his glory, his power, and his care or concern for sinners. That's certainly what Jacob was. Having deceived his father, tricked his brother, stolen his birthright, Jacob was nothing less than a sinner. And yet the Lord cared about Jacob, revealed his glory and his power to Jacob that he would take care of him. The Lord also reveals his glory, his power, and his care for sinners such as us and the promises that were given to Jacob. We pray that the Holy Spirit would bless our study of these verses, this very familiar account, that we too might be comforted. Amen. <coughs> we go back to the promise and the dream that the Lord gives to Jacob in our text. We're told that Jacob had made it about 70 miles. He laid his head down, put his head down on a rock. In verse 12, he said he dreamed. And this dream has three important aspects. You'll notice that there's a very important word that comes out in the Hebrew. It's the word hina, which is translated behold. It means pay attention. Pay attention. Three times. Verse 12. He dreamed and behold. Behold, there was a ladder that was set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. Not just any old dream. A ladder reaching into heaven. Pay attention, the Lord says. And behold, on this ladder, there were angels of God who were ascending and descending on it. Behold, pay attention, listen up. A stairway that leads to heaven. Angels that were ascending and descending upon it, but it gets better. In verse 13, Moses writes, And behold, the Lord, all capital letters, the personal name for God, stood above it and said, three amazing and powerful aspects to this dream. First, the stairway that leads to heaven. Second, angels that were ascending and descending upon this ladder. And third, and most importantly, the Lord himself appearing at the top and speaking to Jacob. What does the Lord say? He says, I, the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. 
Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. It's a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? Full, full of promises from God to Jacob. Now the essence of this vision is that God is with Jacob. It doesn't matter what he's done. It doesn't matter how he's done it. It doesn't matter that he's running from problems from his brother, from his father, from his family, that he doesn't have a dime to his name, that he's not married. The Lord says, I am with you. While your life, Jacob, might be full of uncertainty right now, you can be confident of this one thing. I will be with you. Wherever you go, whatever you face, I will be there. Now, in, in a pictorial way, that's exactly what the ladder, which reached from the earth up to the heaven, describes for us as well. God's connection with the people of this world, with you and me. Quite often, we might feel separate from God, that God, he's great, he's powerful, which we confess, but boy, you know, that I'm just little old me. And God certainly can't be concerned about the problems that I have in my life. They're, they're small in comparison with the problems of the world that God's got to deal with. And a lot of times, like Jacob, we might feel quite uncertain, quite on our own and by ourselves. Here the Lord reminds us that while we can't see it, God is connected to this world. He's connected directly to you and to me with the problems that we face every day of our lives. God has, he's always in touch with the problems that we face, with the issues that we struggle with. He takes a personal interest in every one of our lives. This was God's promise to Jacob, his reassurance to Jacob. It's also his reassurance to us that he is also with us no matter what we might face, no matter what we would go through. God is there taking an interest in our lives, in touch with what we are going through. God doesn't just say, hey, I'm just any God. He makes it very clear to Jacob who it is that is revealing this vision, this promise to him, and is speaking to him the words of comfort that he says. In verse 13, when we get that third behold, the Lord stood above it. We're told that the Lord said, I am the Lord, Yahweh, the God of the covenant, the God of promise, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, your father. Well, this is a very, very important statement. It seems, as we take a look at these verses, as well as the chapter, the chapters that both precede and follow our text, that at this point in Jacob's life, he wasn't quite sure about God who God was, what God was capable of. He probably felt that this God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, had let him down. He had to step into history and take care of things because God hadn't made sure that he was going to follow through on his promise to give him the blessing of his father Isaac. He was kind of holding God at arm's length. Not sure if he really trusted in God. Not sure if he really believed that God existed. So the Lord says, let me tell you who I am. I am the Lord, Jehovah, the God of your grandfather Abraham, the God of your father Isaac. The promises that I have made to them, which I have also made to you, I will fulfill. At this point in Isaac's life, he found himself in a similar situation to what his grandfather Abraham found himself in a couple hundred years earlier. The Lord had come to Abraham and he had made him similar, similar promises. I'm going to make of you a great nation, Abraham. Now, Abraham was married. Jacob wasn't. But they had a similar situation in that 
Abraham's wife, Sarah, was barren, not able to have any children. Jacob wasn't even married. How can you make me a great nation? How can you give me many descendants when I'm not even married or my wife is not able to have children? The Lord reminds Jacob that the Lord is in control, not Jacob. He gives to Jacob a fourfold promise, starting in verse 13. He says, first of all, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. This is what we call the land promise. God had made this promise to Abraham. He had made it to Isaac. And now he's making it and repeating it to Jacob. The promises that I've made to Abraham, to Isaac, I am now making to you. You will, you will be the owner, the inhabitor of this land where you are right now. He goes on, verse 14. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. That's quite a promise for a single guy. I'm going to give you many children. And Jacob said, I'm not even married yet. In fact, your children are going to be so great that they will spread to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. In the generations that would follow, the Lord did fulfill his promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and now to Jacob. In just about 500 years or so, the children of Israel will be in Egypt, the descendants of Jacob, numbering almost 2 million people. The Lord would deliver them from Egypt, bring them to the land of promise that he had given to them, and turn them into the nation of Israel. Their borders stretching from as far as the regions of the deserts to the south, all the way up to Assyria in the north, from the great Mediterranean Sea all the way to the river Euphrates. The Lord would deliver and fulfill this promise of land and children that he makes to Jacob. But there are two additional promises. The le at the end of verse 14, the Lord says, And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This promise the Lord had also made to Abraham. The promise was that through your descendants I will send the Savior. The one who would defeat the devil, crush his head, and set you free, give you life. The first two promises of land and children may not be promises that God makes to us. He doesn't come to us specifically and say, hey, I'm going to give you this land where you, you are. He doesn't say, I'm going to give you many, many children so that they'll reach to the west and the north and the east and the south, all of these areas. But both of these two promises were important in fulfilling the last two promises. In you and in your offspring, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Because the Lord did give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that land and fulfilled it when he brought the children of Israel in to the promised land under the guidance of Joshua. When he made them a great nation, the descendants of Israel, it was through them that Jesus finally, ultimately, was born in that land that God had promised, in the city of Bethlehem, not too far away. The land and the children promise made it possible for God to fulfill his promise of salvation, which is not just for Jacob, but also for us. We are part of that, all the families of the earth which have received this blessing that God fulfilled through Jacob. Finally, he tells us in verse 15, Behold, I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Not only does God give to Jacob a promise of land, a promise of children, a promise of deliverance from sin and from the power of the devil, but he also gives him a promise of protection. I will be with you no matter where you go. In this uncertainty of the time as you journey to Haran and return home, I will be with you. 
throughout your days, throughout your years, I will guard you, I will protect you, I will not leave you. God's promise to Jacob in the salvation as well as the protection is also our promise. He has assured us that we too will have the assurance of God's protection. In Psalm 91, the Lord says, I will give my angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Just as Jacob saw the angels ascending and descending on the ladder, up and down, assured of God's protection, so also God has assured us of his angels, watching out for, caring for us, protecting us. The Lord has made a similar promise to that which is given to Jacob here, to each one of us. The writer to the Hebrews reminds us that God's promise to us is that I will neither leave you nor forsake you. No matter what we might face, no matter what struggles, trials, difficulties we might go through, the Lord says, I will be with you. Jesus himself speaks to us and says, the one who believes in me will never die. Those are our promises. Because of the promise that God has given to Jacob, we too have received great, powerful promises from our God of salvation and of protection. It's a wonderful thing. It's a powerful thing. The assurance, the comfort that our Lord offers to us through his word, just as he offers to Jacob. The question is, how will we respond to God's great, powerful promises of care and protection to us? Moses records Jacob's reaction in the last part of our text. In verse 17 or 16, we're told that Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. This is often called a theophany an appearance or a revelation that God gives of himself to human beings. Have you had a theophany? Have you had a period in your life where God in some amazing, miraculous way has revealed himself, his power, his glory, his care for you? If you've ever had a situation like that where you know the hand of the Lord has been in your life and you look back, you can't help but respond in the same way that Jacob does, saying, surely the Lord is here. And boy, I had forgotten about it. I didn't realize that the Lord was so close to me, present in my daily life. Jacob goes on and he says, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. God demonstrates his presence to us through his word. As we gather here around his word in worship and in praise, the Lord reveals himself, his glory, his power. He describes his care and his protection of us through his word, giving us his rich and bountiful promises. God reveals himself to us through his word, through our worship, but also in the greater way through his sacraments. This morning we have the opportunity, the privilege of seeing how God reveals himself to sinners through the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, offering himself to us through the earthly elements of bread and wine, giving to us his very body and his very blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Now that is a theophany, a revelation of God and his presence to us through the visible elements of bread and wine. With great awe and thanksgiving, we should recognize these times when God reveals himself to us in his word, in worship, and in his sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. But there's something else. 
We should also give our lives in service to the Lord. In verse 20, we're told that Jacob, having had this revelation of God's glory, power, and care, makes a vow. He says, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. That's a wonderful promise, isn't it? Jacob says, I will give my life in service. I will give of the things that God has blessed me with in return to God himself. But you'll notice that Jacob here in his uncertainty of God's existence even after the theophany conditions it, doesn't he? He says, if God will do this for me, then I will do this for God. And how often aren't we just exactly like Jacob? Where we say, you know, God, I've got this problem. It's a big problem. I really need you to take care of it. And if you will solve this problem for me, then I'll give myself in service to you in this way or that way. Maybe one of the most familiar examples of this is Martin Luther. As a young man who is struggling in his faith as well, just like Jacob was on a stormy night, says, Lord, if you'll save me from this storm, I'll give my life in service to you. I'll go into the monastery. Luther wasn't doing it for the right reasons. Now, the Lord worked out a very wonderful result from that. But Luther wasn't going at it with the right attitude, and neither was Jacob. We don't condition our promises to God based on whether or not God will fulfill certain specific promises to us. Rather, we should willingly give our lives in service to God, everything that we have, our time, our talent, our treasures, because we have the rich and bountiful promises of God. We don't have to wait for God to fulfill those promises. They've already been fulfilled. And for us to condition our promises based on some specific desire or wish that we might have is really to condition God's blessing to us, and to fail to see the great things that God has done for us. We should respond in great awe and thanksgiving for God's power, for his glory, for his care and protection, but not by conditioning it, not by putting conditions on the great and all-powerful God who is our creator and our redeemer. He has already done more than we can even think or imagine for us as sinners. May we in true humility rejoice in God's glory, in his power and his care revealed to sinners such as us. May we give him thanks for the promises that he makes in his word, in worship, and in his treasures of the sacraments for us. Thanks be to God that he has revealed himself to us, and that he has kept his promises to us and all people. In Jesus, in his name, amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus, amen.
Please rise for prayer. <clears throat> Almighty God, whose eyes are upon the righteous and whose ears are open to their prayers, hear now the prayer of your people and give to us every needed thing for health of our souls and of our bodies. Dear Father in heaven, we ask that you would keep us always mindful of the words that you spoke from that bright cloud. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Give us of your Holy Spirit so that our trust in your Son is daily renewed and strengthened. By the sign that you gave when Moses and Elijah spoke with our Savior, give us a renewed confidence that those who sleep in death are always alive to you because of your grace in Christ. As we go forth in our daily lives, let the promise of future glory in Christ go with us. In all that we think, in all that we say, in all that we do, let the light of your love show forth to others so that they too may see, that they too might glorify you and come to know the gift of your grace by faith in your Son. Transform our weak and our sinful lives to be good, to be joyful, to be full of love. Take our sicknesses, our pains, our wounds, and our hurts Take our disappointments, our defeats, and our despair. Take our sorrow and our mourning, our pride and our anger, our selfishness and our envy. Take these, O Lord, and transform them by your power, by the power of your word into pure motives, kind thoughts, helpful deeds, courage, and a joyful spirit and true faith. And when our last hour shall come, preserve us in the faith which you have begun in us, so that we shall awaken to a bright, glorious, and eternal reign in heaven with you, with all those who place their trust in you. We ask all of these things in our Savior's name. Amen. We continue with the service of communion as it's found in your bulletin. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and beneficial that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God. And now we praise you that you did send to us your only begotten Son, and that in him, being found in the form of a man, has manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we exalt and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus Christ on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he gave it to his disciples and said to them take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me in the same manner after supper he also took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink from it all of you this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. May the peace of our Lord be with you always. Please be seated. Communicant members of Grace or of another congregation of the Church of the Lutheran Confession may now come forward at the direction of our ushers. May the Lord in his rich and abiding grace comfort each of our communicants through this sacrament. During the distribution, we'll be singing the next two hymns, hymn 318 and 306. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you 
and give you peace. Mm -hmm.